episode of the Linux Action Show is brought to you by the good-looking folks at GoDaddy.com. Use our code Linux and save yourself some cash. <laughs> And welcome to the Linux Action Show, Season 22, Episode 5. My name is Chris, and joining me this week is Matt. Hey, everybody. Hey, Matt. Thanks for uh, coming back. Now, the B-Man's, uh, I think, going to be back next week. Matt would normally be in studio, but he ended up getting a little bit of a, a flu bug. Oh. Still the trooper, though. You decided you'd come on via Skype, so I appreciate that, Matt. You bet. You bet. We have a uh, good show. It's one of those shows that almost would fit in the Hall of Shame category for the Linux Action Show, and I plan to rectify that today. Uh, you know, we have never really talked about logs on Linux, and I think it's because I've been afraid to bring the topic up because it sounds so boring. But I think we can go through it pretty quick but pretty concisely. That gives people a decent overview so you at least you know what these logs do on your computer and how you can access them and get information and search them. And uh, it's a, the, logging, the logging system on Linux is very, very different than it is on Windows. So if you're coming from an event log or something like that, it's a completely different experience with a completely different set of tools. So we're going to give you an overview of some of those. And then in the how-to segment, we'll cover some of the GUI applications you can use to manage those log files. So that'll be a good follow-up. Uh, so we got a, we got a good show today, Matt, but why don't I start with our Linux pick? What do you say? I think that sounds like a plan to me. Let's well, rock it. Every now and then, the uh, the fastest supercomputer in the world is recalculated, and they, they uh, sort of see who is the big champion. Well, once again, that crown has fallen to a Linux computer. The world's fastest supercomputer runs Linux, and it actually runs on Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Now, check this thing out. Uh, this is a massive machine with 1.6 million cores. That is a lot of cores. Yeah, uh, it, it, it said mm. it, it can do what uh, it can. Ca it can calculate in one hour what would otherwise take six point seven billion people using hand calculators three hundred and twenty years to calculate. Well, let me ask you this: What types of applications would you use this for? I would got It's got to be like forecasting mm. models and sure. uh, d scientific data chewing, right? Okay, I mean, so a lot of data crunching then. Yeah, that makes sense. I guess so. You know, you mm -hmm. have to specifically write the applications for this type of... This is what we talked about last week. Remember, last week we covered that new system yep. that was coming out that was just a straight-up Linux box that used some kernel technology to use all the different nodes, whereas with these setups, the applications have to know how to use these different cores. That's true. That makes a lot of sense. No, I definitely understand where you're coming from. I think it's interesting that we periodically will compare where we're at now with supercomputing and then continuously recheck that. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. It's I think interesting it's, to see how that works out. I think it's interesting, too, that we keep comparing to humans, because at this point, it just seems yeah. completely ridiculous. Like, they should start comparing to, like, it could do the workload of X amount of average desktops, or X amount of average x86 servers. I mean, compare it to something, because, like, at this point, 320 years on a calculator, that's just that's just not even a fair metric anymore. Let's just move on. Okay, they've beat us. We can take it. We've, we can accept it. <laughs> Seems like an apples and oranges situation to me, but I guess they're trying to make it palatable to people that are yeah. able to process some of those older technologies. Yeah, make it, make it a little mm -hmm. more uh, quaint, I guess. I don't know. Um, all right, well, I have uh, a amazing Android pick that came from somebody in our IRC chat room, and then on, he submitted it to the Reddit as well. You guys are going to love this one. Also... A great app pick today. But before we get to that stuff, oh, oh, and I might even have something from a distribution. Are you ready for this? Where the maintainer is in the chat room right now. Oh, that's going to be unique. Okay, yeah. that's cool. So, all awesome. right. But all before right. we get to that, though, we got to give a big, big, hearty good morning to GoDaddy.com and the beautiful, beautiful Danica, who's up there Sunday morning, every morning for the Linux Action Show. GoDaddy has a limited time offer. It expires at the end of June. So this episode is on June 24th. So you got to take advantage of this. They have a very special offer. $1.99 for three months for their economy hosting. So if you've had, if you've had like an inkling to do any kind of project, something that you just wanted to put online, maybe it's a WordPress site, maybe it's a forum, maybe it's a wiki, maybe it's a shopping cart, a photo gallery of your barbecue, because it's summertime, uh, Go use this code. Go oh, use yeah. this code. $1.99 hosting. I mean, Matt, can you believe we're talking about $1.99 hosting? I mean, the way I see it is for the you know lack of a cup of coffee, you can actually <laughs> take that same money and go and actually launch an entire project and yeah, then yeah. go from there as to what you I, want to do. With I, it. Just that's think, really, I just that's think cool. back to like uh, when mm -hmm. I was launching Jupiter Broadcasting and trying to huh. find hosting for uh, 
for the site. It could handle a few users and things like that. You know, with with actually not even as generous specs as these as these uh, GoDaddy. The GoDaddy hosting here, you get unlimited bandwidth. I mean, you get unlimited bandwidth. Like that was something that could not be found back in the day. It oh was, no, you yeah, were absolutely that, limited. It was a right. big deal. So it's changed. Yeah, I know. It's fantastic. Mm. The, the, the amazing things of scale. So use our code 199Linux when you check out to take advantage of that $1.99 hosting for three months. 199Linux when you check out. Or if you just want to save some money off your order, use our promo code Linux and you'll get 10% off when you check out. And thank you to GoDaddy for supporting this episode of the Linux Action Show and Jupiter Broadcasting. All right, sir. Why don't I get to my Android pick this week? I'm very excited. This came from Disco in the IRC chat room, who then also is Disco on the uh, Linux Action Show subreddit. And he didn't think I saw this because he, he snuck it in there during one of our shows, and I was just kind of keeping an eye on the <laughs> chat room. So I did catch it, and I saved the link, and I checked it out, and it is awesome. It's called Tap Chat. And uh, Tap Chat is a two-part Android application. You get the client part in the Android market. You get from their website, a little agent that you can install with an RPM or a Deb or a TarGZ that you put on your desktop. And that desktop agent logs into your favorite IRC servers and rooms and then gives you a persistent connection that you can check in on from the phone, but it doesn't take any phone battery because what, what, the, what the agent on your desktop does is it stores the IRC conversations in a SQLite database locally. So super small, compact little SQLite library database that it's nice and efficient. And then when your phone connects in, it can retrieve that information and then you can resume right where you're left off. It's very, very well done too. The artwork, if you're looking at the video version, there's a slideshow playing, is, is very, very nice. Um, it's what's cool about it, Matt, and uh, it, it's created. Uh, so the the app again, the name is Tap Chat, and I'll have a link in the chat room. Mm -hmm. It's created by a software company called Code Butter, who's run by a gentleman named Eric Butler. Now, what's interesting about Eric Butler is he is the author of Fire Sheep. Now, do you know what Fire Sheep is? Does that ring a bell? I do. I am very familiar with Fire Sheep, especially if you've uh, frequented coffee shops at any point. <laughs> exactly. Fire Sheep was that Firefox extension that's still around that you can install, and it will it will sniff like a Wi-Fi network at a coffee shop, like Matt's mm -hmm. saying, and it will collect session information about like Facebook and Twitter, and then it's actually able to reassemble some of their pages and get you in there with their cached credentials and things like that, depending on how the site's structured and if it's using SSL. I mean, a very advanced and very controversial Firefox extension. I had no idea, idea this guy was in the Pacific Northwest. I, I'd love to get oh, him okay. on Coda Radio or something. Wouldn't that be awesome? That'd be fantastic. Well, and getting back to the uh, to the Firefox extension itself, I think it also serves as a reminder as a, to be more security conscious. I, th I, support, I support it. I think it's fantastic. Yeah. I yeah. think it's really cool that they do have something like that because it causes you to really step back and think, well, maybe I need to reevaluate how I do things. And I think yeah. having something like that is definitely – you know, making a step up and being I, more uh, aware I of what's agree. going on. I think yeah. I think Firesheep was responsible for both uh, Facebook and uh, Gmail for stepping up their SSL support. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so, that's just my my take on it. I think it's a no brainer. Yeah. This is cool. I like the app that he's got with TapChat, though. This looks really. And so you're telling me that this doesn't use any any real battery usage because of the way it's uh, the way set it's up storing on your yeah, yeah, it's storing it's storing in a database on your desktop, which is really nice. So then you just you just connect to it and pull down whatever has happened, mm -hmm. whatever the de delta is since the last time you connected. Well, it looks like the workflow and the app itself is very smooth. Yeah, yeah. It's a, very, it's, very smooth. It's definitely one of those very nice-looking Android mm -hmm. applications, too. So go check that out. It is called Tap Chat. All right. Now, I have a very, very personal desktop app pick for Linux this week. This is one that has been in my heart for a long, long time, and I've just been waiting for an opportunity to share it on the show. It is called Terminator. Are you familiar with Terminator? Not the movie. It is, no. the, uh, it is the terminal emulator for Linux. Now, there are comparable de terminal emulators. There's a lot of them, actually. And KDE does some of these things just with console by default. But uh, Terminator is a very simple GTK-based terminal. It's a single window at first. But then you can do things like right-click, and you can say split horizontally. And then you get, a new, you get a new window in there, and you can say split vertically. And I love these kinds of things because what I will do is... I might so so I have different size windows. I might be SSH into different servers in each window, and in in depending on what the work requirements are, I could do like uh, top in the in the window that gives me a lot of screen real estate, right? And mm. I could do a PS in a smaller window, and I can I can really do a lot of different things. And and why this app is a great pick for this week is I could do something say like uh, let's say I'm affecting some changes on a server, and I want to monitor how that's going. I could do something like tail 
dash F, which we'll talk about later in the show, and I can go tail a, 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 a the messages file, or in uh, 1204's case, the syslog file, and then I can start doing things on that server, like... And you can see both windows automatically updated because one window is monitoring my log files as I make changes on the server. The other window is where I'm actually affecting my changes. And you can do different configuration layouts too. So what I love about it is it's really whatever your workload is for the day. It's a, it's, it can be just a standard single window terminal, which you know is just a it's very fast standard window terminal. But it can also be a, a, a very customized work environment that you can fit to the exact workload you're doing that day. So uh, I, I frequently will, depending on what I'm doing, like if I'm working on something, say, on the website, I will have VI up in the big window. I will have my FTP client up in the smaller window because it's just small little FTP commands. And I might have like Wget or something in the other window. And I, I don't have to be switching around windows a lot. And I can maximize this and it can take over my entire desktop. And it's sort of like a tiled desktop in one virtual desktop. It, it, I'm getting a little crazy, but uh, one of the other really nice features about it is because it's all within one application, you can do things like send, uh, send output and input to all of the screens. So like I can turn broadcast on and I can say uh, uh, echo farts, right? And you'll see all of the terminals now echoed farts because I, I broadcasted that command in all of them. Or I could echo exit to all, to all windows and I just closed all of the terminal sessions. So you can do you could so if you say for example needed to shut down four or five servers at once you could use terminator to ssh into all four or five servers and then broadcast halt and it would send the halt command to all servers at once. I've done this too if I'm doing very standard like I just want to do app get update on four or five machines at once. I'm not even going to do upgrade. I just want to do an update. I'll, I can just do do that and then type the command once update and it does it. And those kinds well, of things. That's interesting. One thing I was going to ask you, and this is more for the uh, listeners and uh, viewers, of course. So how would this differentiate itself from, say, a uh, tabbed terminal? So I open a terminal and I'm just simply running different tabs. It sounds like basically it's more of a spacing issue. Yeah, it's, 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 I'd say it's two factors. It's, you can space mm -hmm. it out so you can have, you can have different size terminal windows. So if I know a top if I know a top command is very long vertically, but it's oh, yeah. not very long horizontally, I can make that a very narrow column terminal and then I can have a fat wider column terminal over here and then a, in a, another box down here but the other thing this the tab the tab interface is nice if you don't need to monitor the other ter terminals at the same time that where in this sense. case if you're like if you're like if you're doing top and you kill a process and you want to actually see that process go off the list in real time it's nice to have both of those things up at the same time right so without having to jump to another tab i see what you're saying yeah, okay yeah and it's also well, nice i like it yeah it's mm -hmm. also nice because it's just lightweight and quick you know, so that's that's a plus too. It just fires right up. And I'm just looking at the screenshots here. I mean, this looks really powerful, and I like the fact that it does work within your uh, within your monitor, within your resolution here. This yeah. is pretty slick. Yeah, it's looks nice. Looks like and it auto fills real nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, it just maximizes. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Lots of shortcuts to oh. all kinds of things. Uh, so check it out, Terminator. I'll have a link to it in the show notes, but it really should be uh, in your distro's repo. Uh, if it's not in your distro's repo. Um, you should probably get a new Linux distribution because that's just really sad because it's a good app. And it I'm be with it. you on that. I think this looks like something you really need to have. Speaking of a really mm. good distro, it's one that I personally love a lot, and they just released a brand new mm. version this week. Pingai, Pingai, Pingui, Ping, Pinky, Pingai, Pingui. Pingai OS 1204 has been released, and the uh, maintainer is in the chat room right now. He's very excited about this release, and it looks super solid. Now, if you guys remember, we actually reviewed a, an earlier version of this on the show uh, and loved it. In fact, it was in my candidates of, I could run this always forever. It, it goes beyond just, it's an Ubuntu derivative, it's it's... and it's more like it's based on a good, solid platform, and it brings a lot of extras onto it, so... Um, Check it out. They've released a new uh, version. And of course, because it's built on 12.04, they're going to be able to take advantage of the long-term support package releases that that distribution has. So they'll be able to continue to update their version, uh, which, is, which is pretty cool. And their community is really growing, too, which is kind of mm -hmm. neat to get in. Uh, a, a Linux distribution at this phase, there's a lot of really exci uh, excited energy around it. So mm -hmm. it's a good community to get in right now. And they've got forms up now and all those kinds of things. So go check it out. One of the things that uh, if you're watching the video version, you probably notice is they've got a pretty uh, sweet-looking desktop from, That's uh, gorgeous. Yeah, it's oh. absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, yep. There you go. So, anyways, Pingai OS, and uh, it is based on Ubuntu twelve oh four with lots of tweaks, lots of custom applications, lots of things that I would do anyways, like adding menu bar applets mm -hmm. and uh, you know new launchers, and so it's it's a very it's a very hearty recommend recommendation for me. I've I've learned to really love that distribution. So go check it out, and you can find it over at P I N G 
U-Y-O-S dot com or link and, in the show And notes. I wonder if it's also worth noting, and most of us probably know this, but some of us may not have thought of it, is that if, if this is based on Ubuntu, that means you can run uh, Ubuntu devs. You don't, you're don't. you not limited to just what's in the immediate repositories. If there's something right. on uh, right. getdev.net or something, you can run that. Yeah. No, I think that's 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 what I like about it is it's mm-hmm. just, just a huge software compatibility, but you don't have to deal with there, if there's certain things about Ubuntu that annoy you. You can, you can kind of just get away exactly. from those. <laughs> you can kick You can kick that to the curb and get all yeah. the good stuff. Uh, now, now, uh, Matt, uh, I okay. have a big announcement in regards to the uh, Jupiter Broadcasting Radio Project we're going to be launching. Last week, we talked about airtime, right? We did. Mm-hmm. And uh, we reviewed airtime and then get a little how-to on how to get it rolling. Well, I put a little bug out there. I said, you know, if people would have an interest in hosting a radio show or, or have a music collection they want to share that, you know, Creative Commons on, on the air, you know, contact me and we'll talk. Mm-hmm. Wow, what a response. Um, and not only that... But I got a response from the Source Fabric guys, the guys that make airtime, and they had some some comments, and they hooked us up with a with an awesome gift for the show. So uh, I'm going to talk about all of that at the end of the show in the feedback section. I've got an email we're going to answer about data recovery under Linux, and uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, the Jupiter Broadcasting um, Radio Project and uh, more information about the DJ draft that's going on. So uh, oh, we're, exciting we're stuff! Putting the yeah. word out. So that'll be coming up towards the end of the show. But Matt, all let's right. do the news. <laughs> So, what's new in the news? All right, Matt, the NVIDIA controversy continues. You remember last week our top story was uh, Linus Torvald's not-so-discreet message to NVIDIA about their lack of Linux participation? Oh, do I ever. What a mess that was. Yes, I do. Mm. <laughs> the, well, the mess train keeps on rolling because there's been... There, not only has there been some comebacks from NVIDIA, which are pretty limp wrist, but there's also been some actual progress. Uh, but first of all, I want to cover this story that came out of China. Now... I want to advise you, this story is rumor, but it's been confirmed by a couple of different sources, so it's looking pretty solid. But it looks like NVIDIA might have lost out on a huge order in China due to issues with their Linux driver blob. Uh, And the basic story goes is there's this Chinese uh, educational company that uses their own MIPS-based CPU because they they didn't... China actually develops its own CPU because they don't want to be dependent on technology from the West. Mm -hmm. And so... NVIDIA's driver, of course, isn't written to their CPU's architecture. So they said, well, we want to do a big, like, 10,000 PC order or something like that. It was a very large number. Um, and it was going to be in somewhere around the $350 million mark they, to NVIDIA. And they wanted to buy a, a set of their Quadro, $350 million with their quadro, quadro video cards. But they needed NVIDIA to alter the driver to work on their MIPS CPU. And NVIDIA said, well, we can do that. But you're going to need to pay us, you know, $7 million or so to, to pull that off because we are going to have to do the R&D on that. It's only for you guys. So this is a one-off thing. And, you know, you got to pay us for the, what they call non-reoccurring engineering costs. Well, to better understand that, so in addition to the sum that they're spending to buy this hardware, they're saying we want an additional $7 million? Yeah, for, for wow. the Wow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty bold on NVIDIA's part, I think. But. Well, that's how the Chinese company mm. felt. In fact, they were yeah. very frustrated by that. I would be too. So they said, screw you. And they walked away from the NVIDIA deal and they went over and they uh, they looked at the AMD situation. And this is where AMD has been able to take a lead in this regard is they said the AMD's driver is now excluding the 7000 series. Their open source driver is now competi- competitive enough that we can take that code and make it run on our CPU yeah. and accomplish what we wanted to accomplish. No thanks, NVIDIA. And this is an interesting yeah. thing because this is a major deal. This is a three hundred fifty million dollar hardware deal because that Chinese company is still spending that money on, on now on AMD GPUs, right? So that's money lost. Just you know, it's foolish, foolish, foolish. They they could have completely avoided that had they been willing to work with them and not been so penny wise, pound foolish. I think. Well, I think it's always hard mm. to to prove to these companies the the real dollar value in open sourcing your code because from a yeah. traditional business model, I could see how old staunchy guys are just like that. Wait, giving away the code, which has intellectual property in it, that just seems crazy. But this is a real hard this is a real hard dollar value you can assign to this now. Well, there's two big factors that NVIDIA is just completely head between the knees on that I don't understand is that China is a booming a booming market right now, especially in this space, especially the fact that there are certain restrictions on being able to use our uh, our technology, U.S. technology in China. So they're doing a lot of their own stuff. And because they're booming, it would be in NVIDIA's best interest to suck it up, eat the $7 million, collect on 
you know, 30 plus 40, 50, whatever in the future and actually work with them properly. Yeah. Um, it just, it, it's, it's such an obvious non, it's not even open source. It's just a dollars and cents thing. It's so stupid that they would have done that. Just mind blowingly stupid. Now, unfortunately, mm. AMD doesn't completely save the day because their mm. driver is still lacking some critical features that, like, the NVIDIA proprietary driver has. And I believe even AMD's own proprietary driver has, like, uh, again, HD 7000 series root support. That's a little right. ridiculous at this point. Those have been out for a while. Uh, also, the driver, uh, open source driver, only goes up to OpenGL 3.0, so there's no 3.1, mm. 3.2. There's even 4.1 that's out and 4.2 at this point. Uh, there's sure. also missing features like crossfire support, advanced uh, anti-aliasing modes, and OpenCL, which is important for a lot of these computational jobs, is still a work in progress. Also, their power management isn't as good, and performance is off compared to the pri proprietary driver too. It is, yeah. That's been my experience. So it's not a per it's not a perfect solution yeah. from AMD, but it's a better one than than the NVIDIA one, which really tells you something. Well, and it may actually, even though AMD's got some shortcomings, if they're able to get their foot in the door, guess guess who China's going to go back to in the future? Uh, you know, it's, oh, again, totally. it's a dollars and cents issue. It's such right. a common sense thing. So, yeah, good for AMD. You well, know, and what, what could very likely well. happen is this Chinese uh, educational company could make modifications to improve the driver that then ATI could elect to use. Exactly. And they could improve their driver across all Linux systems. Oh, so. absolutely. Exactly. And it's much, you know, explosion with Linux and stuff that's going on in China and other parts of that region. Uh, it is it is definitely going to be in AMD's best interest. And NVIDIA definitely uh, screwed themselves on this one, I think. It was a yeah. big, big mistake. So this is exciting. And it's going to be great for us if they do make those changes and send them upstream. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. Now, of course, I think NVIDIA is starting to recognize that they need to kind of step up, that the way things have been for a long time aren't good anymore, that Linux has come up mm. another rung in the ecosystem, and, and they're not they're not catching up. And mm. to that end, uh, Stephen Warren over on the uh, Kernel Summit mailing list emailed and said, hey, I'd like to make the Kernel Summit this year. And uh, I think he's from NVIDIA, and I think there's a couple of things I'd be interested in talking about. Uh, he said, mm. within the constraints, I should uh, perhaps cover uh, how, Im how NVIDIA employees can be contributing to the Linux kernel better, uh, he also went on to say that are there any new or novel ideas I could take back to, to NVIDIA to help pers uh, persuade any kind of opening up? I'd be happy to feed anything interesting into the chain. Um, so he's saying, you know, if we can go there and we can come up with some really good value propositions to NVIDIA, I'll take them back to the company and, and try to champion for them. He's got some other comments in here, too. He responds a little bit to Linus's comment and things like that. So I'll link to that right. in the show notes. But he basically says, you know, I'm going to come to the conference with my tail between my legs after what Linus said is <laughs> essentially what it boils down to. Well, I, I think it is two quick thoughts before I let this go. Honestly, if, uh, is this PR spin or is he serious? You know, it, 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 did his boss send him down to do this or is he dead serious on actually making these changes necessary? Because I've seen companies like NVIDIA say stuff like this before and then revert back to old habits. So yeah. let's hope yeah. he's right. Let's hope he well, is, has the freedom to do this. I believe his intentions. I just, I'm skeptical. Yeah, skeptical. well, I think, I think you've picked up on an important part there. It sounds like yeah. this is an effort on his part, not an effort from his management, right. which means it yeah. doesn't have widespread support, which means he's going to have limited success. Unless exactly. he's got, unless, unless Stephen Warren has some really big pull in the company. Which I hope he does, and I wish him all the, way, all the best. If he can make this work, then awesome. Yeah. So. All right, well, why don't we uh, one more video driver story. It's been a busy mm -hmm. week in the video space uh, for Linux, and uh, then we'll get out of the video land. Uh, just a real quick note, AMD is open sourcing their Linux execution and compilation stack. And I don't really know the full implications of this, but uh, this is from a statement that they've made, and uh, they say, AMD's open source commitment to the HSA, we will open source our Linux execution and compilation stack. This is being done to jumpstart the HSA ecosystem and allow a shared implementation where appropriate to enable university research in all areas. So I wonder if this is related to the China story we just covered. If they're uh, smart, it is. Mm -hmm. Which this should improve... The big thing about this is this should improve their OpenCL support, I believe. I'm not sure, but I believe this is one of the hindrances to getting good OpenCL support under Linux. So we'll see. Should be interesting to watch. It's definitely going to be something to follow up on, I think. Yeah. Why don't we talk about Nokia for a little bit? Uh -huh. Shifting over into the QT land. QT uh, has had an interesting ride over at Nokia since they've made their deal with Microsoft to go mm. Windows Phone. And now would it appear that the what is being called, quote unquote, the leadership and strategy QT team has been laid off from Nokia this week. Oh. Uh, no. So uh, the uh, so here's here's a few comments. Uh, it sounds like there's a certain division that's been laid off in uh, in Berlin and Brisbane, and that uh, it's not like all QT workers, uh, which some headlines are are saying, have been laid off at Nokia. But it's definitely a major blow to the QT efforts underway. And it, you know, 
Uh, it's sad, uh, but I, I, I got to say, who didn't see this coming? I saw it coming for a while now, and uh, it's going to be a reshaping. Hopefully, they can make it work for them. I think Nokia has such deep-rooted problems going all the way up the chain of command that this is really uh, yeah. cutting off their nose despite their face. It's, well, it's, and you know, I think this is one of those things where QT itself is fundamentally stronger than Nokia is. That's so, my yeah, exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, if, and they always have been. I if, you know, if even people, beforehand. Maybe these people can go work for a foundation, or maybe there's companies that have a vested yep. interest in QT that can hire these people up, and then they'll be in a healthier system for for that project perfect i and i agree that i would agree with that i yeah. agree with i think dumping nokia at any level is going to be good for them and i think creating a foundation yeah that that could definitely help um it just depends on how much uh interconnection to nokia they would have even despite yeah. the foundation right because so. there's still very important yeah. parts that are owned and live at nokia, yeah. at nokia around qt exactly and, and the question is is how how long do we just watch Nokia wither away before you just are going to start seeing a mass exodus of talent? Because usually yep. what starts happening is after these rounds of layoffs, the people that are really still their A players, they just start leaving. They just start bailing. And I think now the question is, how, when does that start happening? Or is it already happening? Because now I'd this say it's is, probably already happening. Think yeah. about it. I mean, because if I'm, if I'm a, a top talent for XYZ Incorporated and they're laying off all the underlings, uh, people that maybe are not up to, the, uh, up to speed with my skill set, I'm going to be thinking, you know, this may not be a company that has a long-term future, and I need to start shopping around now. Chat room, you know, chat room is across mm. the board. Chat room says, you know, we need Nokia to to, to do this because we need QT funded. Yeah. Uh, people are saying, hey, you know what? It's open source now. They don't need management. That's what open oh. source governance is for. Exactly. So, uh, either you know, there's a lot of different opinions on the topic, but I'm on the sec- I'm in the secondary camp. I think it needs to be. I think it needs to be in a foundation and separate. I really that, do. That would be great. That would be great. Yeah. All right. Uh, last couple of weeks, I think maybe three weeks ago, maybe so it wasn't last week, maybe it was even a month ago, we mm-hmm. talked about uh, Fedora's deal with Microsoft to sign Fedora 18. Mm. That way it would load on UFIE secured Windows 8 labeled machines uh, where Microsoft is the gatekeeper to, uh, to allow software to boot on a computer. And Fedora got a key through VeriSign and they paid the 100 bucks and they're signing everything from their bootloader down to their kernel. And now, a lot of people have wondered, what are the other distros going to do? So Canonical has posted, uh, kind of cryptically on their blog, really, to tell you the truth, what their intentions are with uh, UEFI and Secure Boot. And it revolves around dropping Grub2, which is Mm. not a very well-received move. No, Um, no, it wouldn't be. So the Ubuntu, mm. Ubuntu will not be using Grub2 by default on systems where Secure Boot is enabled. So they'll probably do some sort of detection and installation. Uh, now, here's what's interesting. They're not using Grub2 because they're worried about GPL3 violations. Mm-hmm. Right. No, that makes sense. I see where they're coming from. Because if somebody had yeah. to get the code, they would have to disclose their private key. Yeah, yeah and that just becomes a big circular mess. So, uh, that's so, too bad. So what they're going to do is they're going to utilize uh, uh, an Intel solution. Here, I'll get to that in just a second. But what they, what okay. they also touch on is... Uh, if an OEM shipping Ubuntu pre-installed ships a Grub2 enabled Ubuntu release where there is Canonical's private secure boot key, they think as part of the GPL3, they might have to disclose their private key with the source code so users could install a modified bootloader. If the private key was publicly known, it would be revoked. And that's, that's part of the standard mm-hmm. and spec is that that happens. So what Canonical has decided to, u- to do is use Intel's EFI Linux loader which is like used on Macs right now, mm-hmm. that is more liberally licensed, and they would be able to make some modifications to provide a simple menu interface. Interesting idea. It would definitely sidestep the GPL uh, 3 whole thing. Yeah, I mean, if they can make it work and not completely tick everyone off during the long... Yeah, it's going to be a wait-and-see kind of thing. I'm, I'm skeptical. I'm, I'm very skeptical. I'm skeptical, too, because uh, Grub 2 is very feature-rich, it's very yeah. standardized, and... Uh, when when you were all of a sudden hit with a new, I mean, do you remember the transition from Lilo to Grub? Oh, that was kind yeah. of painful. It's and hideous. Yes. Are we going to see that kind of thing again, or can we do it more intelligently now? I, I, I just, at least well, you, at least this bootloader, this EFI Intel bootloader, has been used by Ubuntu on Ubuntu for Mac systems right. for a well, while. So. And just the transition from you know from Grub to Grub Two, I believe it or not, was a was a massive <laughs> undertaking because it's they were so different. All yeah. the things that they would do to you know repair Grub, uh, those aren't working anymore. You know, uh, Super Grub, totally you had to completely re- retool right. and rethink that whole situation. You know, as far as the recovery disk for Grub, um, 
Yeah, it, it, so if it was that big a deal just going from Grub to Grub 2, then imagine what this is going to be like. I, I think this is going to be definitely a Lilo Grub kind of situation. I think it's going to be messy. Potentially. Very messy. Potentially. Yeah. Now, one of the things Canonical is doing differently than what Fedora did mm-hmm. is Canonical is only signing Ubuntu's bootloader. They're not mm-hmm. signing the kernel. Okay. And so what that means, remember, okay, so Fedora is signing the kernel, which means you, you can't even add, like, kernel modules, like, like, uh, right. like the NVIDIA binary blob. Uh, because it it's not signed, so you you'd have to go into an unsecured mode. Now you can do that, and it's not it's not impossible. But by default, Fedora 18 on a secure boot system will have a signed bootloader and a signed kernel. So all the way from the boot, all the way up the stack, is completely signed, and you can't modify it. That's crazy, right? So what Ubuntu's That's approach terrible. here is going to be is only the bootloader signed, the kernels unsigned. So you can load any modules you want, and and, and you know drivers and things like that. Uh, it's going to be an interesting comparison because hmm. it's going to be an out, it's going to be a lot of different it, 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 the out of box experience between Ubuntu and Fedora will be very different if Ubuntu is still going to have one click video driver and network card driver installs and Fedora is now going to have another extra layer to get those drivers working. I think it'll further differentiate the audiences uh, or the users rather. I think that definitely is going to create an even further separation um and maybe that's okay you know i can't say whether that's bad or good but i definitely think it's going to push the divide even further yeah and you know there might be there's some there's the the worst thing about secure boot and i don't like it because it makes microsoft the gatekeeper Mm. and there's things out there like core boot that people really need to look into that i'd love to see some vendors get behind but uh, and uh, the thing about secure boot though is it does give some level of peace of mind that the fundamental basics of the operating system haven't been modified in a way that the administrator doesn't expect. True. So true. I see why, like on a server, that could be a good yeah. thing to have your kernel signed, so that way somebody hasn't loaded some sort of rootkit or something like that. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, I get the I get the plausible you know reasoning behind it. I just, as you said, I would love to see more of a uh, community oriented solution versus a Microsoft controlled solution. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, if we can if we can find that happy medium, or even use this as a case study of oh wow, right idea, wrong implementation, let's find something uh, a little more community friendly. Maybe that'll be the push we need. Who also, uh, uh, Canonical plans to make their own key. So this is a little different track mm. from Fedora. That, mm. that, that OEMs like I would assume System seventy six, but who knows, mm-hmm. uh, will be able to be able to uh, put the key in themselves. So uh, mm-hmm. they they will have an Ubuntu key. So if you That's go, cool. if you get an Ubuntu OEM system, it could potentially be signed with an with a Canonical key, and Microsoft wouldn't be in the picture at all. And Canonical's even researching setting up their own portal for OEMs to go and generate their own keys for their systems they sell, which could be a very good approach because then Microsoft they're they're following the secure spec, they're paying the ninety nine dollars to VeriSign, but mm-hmm. Microsoft isn't involved in the process at all. That sounds better to me. Yeah, I, 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 I can stomach that. And I think definitely the OEMs are going to go uh, with the approach, most of them anyway, are going to go with the approach, which is easiest on the end user. Um, and that's my, and I think that's a good philosophy to have. Uh, but when you start getting into more of the DIY stuff, it's going to be interesting to see how that works out. It's yeah. going to be a lot of uh, hopscotch, I think. Yeah, I mean, we'll follow that stuff on the show. So, you know, mm-hmm. we'll keep people informed of what's going on, but um, don't know yet. Don't yeah, know. It'll be we'll interesting. See. Once these. Uh, once these, well, it all comes down to these machines that are ready for Windows 8. If they have ready for Windows 8 or Windows 8 whatever compatible on there, that means they have to follow Microsoft's logo program, which means they have to implement the uh, UEFI, UFEI, uh, whatever the crap, secure boot stuff. That's how you know. And, and if it's a PC that you build yourself that doesn't have the Microsoft uh, blessed stuff, they'll probably have support for it on the chip at that point, but it might even be turned off by default. Um, so More than likely. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. This really is going to apply to off the shelf PCs more than anything so yeah, like real. the ones your family buys or things like that um yeah okay All why right. don't we move on to a app that's coming to the linux desktop very soon and that's one that is sort of if you remember jacosher mm-hmm. oh, and yeah. you're familiar with apple's garage band it's kind of like those only it looks much 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 more sophisticated much more advanced much more powerful it's called bit wig studio and it's been demoed on linux so we know it's really coming and uh, it does things like loops and i've got a little video of it playing here and it it can do things like virtual instruments and you can Mm -hmm. assemble songs and music with beats and different tracks and it looks like a really great program Uh, bitwig's been around since 2009 and uh, they've worked on a lot of other really cool projects and they're coming out with a beta you can there's in the show note links the story has a link to sign up for their beta. You'll be able to assemble like beats and drums and, and cymbals and a vocal track and generate 
genuine music that sounds really awesome. So this is a so it's called Bitwig Studio. It looks really cool. It looks like a really great app, very pro looking. Um, it's been around for other operating systems, but it's coming to Linux. So uh, go sign up for the beta. Link is in the story that is in the show notes. It looks pretty cool, and I think it's also an uh, indication of a bigger uh, transition that we're seeing more and more pro-level applications coming to Linux. I, there seems to be another video editor. I can't think of the name off the top of my head. Uh, Lightworks. Pro-level. Lightworks, that's it, that despite some back and forth, does look like is an yeah. impact coming here soon. Yeah. Um, I think those two applications together, you know, we're beginning to see more adoption in that space, and that you know, could be the thing that finally gets things like Photoshop and stuff uh, over to our side of the fence. Just out of competition? I, I think it, they're going to eventually have to. Um, there's so many uh, Me Too applications to Photoshop already coming to Linux anyway, uh, mm-hmm. besides, you know, obviously the open source solution. So I think, I think it can happen, and I'm excited for it. I think it'd be great. Choice is good. Yeah. So. Cool. Absolutely. So go check that out. All right. Now, before we go on, I'd like to remind everyone that you can support the network. Yes, you. You help us keep the sponsorship to a very minimum by using our affiliate links over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Now, if you scroll all the way down to our website over at jupiterbroadcasting.com, at the very bottom of the page, we have links down there for Amazon US, UK, newegg.com if you're a new egg shopper, Think Geek if you're a Think Geek shopper, bestbuy.com, mint.com, which mint's free, but they still give us a kickback if you sign up through it, audible.com com which has an amazing Android app and uh, Gamefly. We also have a Chrome extension you can use down there at the bottom. It'll work on most of the sites that support that and then it just does it for you automatically. Uh, using those affiliate links is a great way to support the network while you're getting yourself something. And like I said, the thing I love about it is it means we answer to you guys. Same with the donations. We answer to you. We don't have to answer to a bunch of advertisers. We don't have to put four ads in every show because our revenues are down and go to meeting wants an extra ad in here. We just keep things as little minimal as possible thanks to your help by using those affiliate links. And, you know, Matt, people tell me they use it for things like office supplies to computer oh, yeah. orders. I mean, it's, it's awesome. So I thank everyone out there who does that. Good way to do it. All right, Matt. Well, that's all the news for this week. We talk about logs on the show, Matt. Now, I know people are sitting there and they're thinking, logs, are you guys serious? But if you're thinking that, then you need to hear this segment because there's a few things you can learn by looking in your logs that will save you a lot of time and teach you a lot more about Linux. And there's some tools that make it super easy to do it. We're going to talk about the graphical tools in the how-to segment. In this segment, we're going to talk about the command line tools. So you're going to get both. That'll be fun, right? Absolutely. I think that's the way to go is to kind of give them a taste of both. You know, a little bit of GUI and a little bit of command line. Doesn't hurt to have a fallback. No. So the the command line ones are always great if you're remoted in through SSH or something like that, too. I want to talk about a change that I believe happened in Ubuntu 12.04, and that is they changed from the standard var log messages file. So if if you look at your computer on most systems, there's a lot of things that log to this file called var log messages. And these things are being written there by probably two different types of processes on your computer. Syslog D and Klog D. The Klog D is the kernel logger, and Syslog D is the is the Syslog component that all the different applications on your Linux box send their communications to, and then it writes it to the log file. Or, in, depending on your configuration, it can actually transmit it over the network. It can send it to remote systems. It can break it out into multiple files. It can generate email alerts. It's a very sophisticated system. But by default. They just have it right to your local file. And even the most complex enterprise setups will often just use the standard syslogging components that come on every Linux distribution. It's an extremely powerful logging system. that you just it's, It is an enterprise-class logging system on your desktop. And it's very cool what you can do with it. Now, in Ubuntu, it no longer writes to var slash log slash messages. It writes to var slash log slash syslog. And uh, we can take a look here on my, uh, my Ubuntu 12.04 box. Is, uh, here's an example of one of our first commands. You might be familiar with the cat command. Cat. So we'll go mm-hmm. cat var log syslog. And you'll see the output, if you're watching the video version, of my syslog messages on my screen. And these are, each line represents a different input from a different application on my computer. So you can see uh, the last line in my log is from cron. The one before that is from uh, an application I'll be talking about in a minute. Now, if I just wanted to see the last few lines of that file, I could use a command called tail. Tail can do var log syslog, or probably like if you're on Fedora or another distribution, it would be your messages file, not the syslog file. And now, tail just shows me the last 10 lines, the last five lines, whatever you set it to. So if, watch, if I do a, if I do a clear screen and I rerun that command, you'll see that it's just a smaller subset of the screen. And this is a live, write. this file is being written to 
all the time on your system. So if you wanted to, you could actually use the tail command to do say something like tail dash f var log syslog. Like Matt was saying on the pre-show, you mentioned you had this problem where something was going on and you knew something was wonky on your system. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to see something kept right into your log file, like a bad block on device slash dev slash SDA, bad block, bad block, bad block, you can use this command tail dash F. And what tail dash F does is it says, watch the last line in this file. And every time the last line in this file is updated, echo that output to the terminal window. So here you can see I have a tail running, and if I do a few spaces down, I'll go over here and I'll use the logger command, L-O-G-G-E-R, and the logger command lets you write to your log. So you can actually, in your own scripts, use logger to output stuff into your log. So I will put logger, I love sandwiches, okay? So I'll put that in quotes, logger, I love sandwiches. And when I hit enter here, I now see immediately updated on my other, oh, come on, mouse. Come on, mouse. There we go. I love sandwiches now comes out on my tail output. So you can see it's watching that log file in real time. So there's some. There's also some other things you can do with these tools, but I just wanted to kind of give you a brief overview with tail and cat. So that's how you look at these log files that are on your computer. Take a look, though, on your system when you're in there. Look around in the var log directory. You'll be surprised how many files actually live in this directory. So example, on my, uh, on my Ubuntu box here, you can go into the Samba folder, and you can see that Samba actually has its own set of logs in here that are completely separate from the other log files. Same with Apache. Same with things like apt. I can go here and my I can look at my apt log. So let's look at my history file. I will do a cat history. Oh boy, look at all that stuff that came up. So you can see there's different things you can diagnose different problems by going in here and digging through these different log files. Now, one thing that uh, you if you're switching from Windows that you might be a little familiar with is device manager. And you might kind of wonder, is there an equivalent device manager on Linux? Right? Something you can just look at all of the hardware that's been detected by your kernel in one screen. And you can dig around in proc, and you can find a lot of stuff. But what you sure. really want, and Matt, you were just talking about this, I was. is the dmessage command. My favorite command. So if you go, so just think of it as device message, M-E-S-G. And if you hit that, it's going to fly on my screen. But if I go through it, watch this. So I'll type dmessage, and then I'll use the pipe symbol, and mm-hmm. I'll type in more. And now I can increment through dmessage and see it page by page. And I can see, okay, it detected an Intel genuine CPU. It sees my BIOS version is this. It sees this much physical uh, video memory. And I can go through this and I can go, oh, okay, I'll go there. There's my video card. Okay, I see TCP TCP IP was started. And, oh, there's my ATA devices. So now I can actually see that, okay, my... My hardware device lives at this slash dev slash SDA device. So that new drive I just connected. If you just plugged in a USB device, for example, and you wanted to see it show up in your D, in, on your system, you'd hit dmessage, and the last log line on, in dmessage would be a new hardware device has been plugged in, and it's available at this mount point. Or it could be mounted here. Exactly. Well, that's what happened when I was running it for myself. I plugged in a USB headset. Uh, I was playing YouTube, and it wasn't playing. And I'm thinking, well, the only thing I've done differently, you know, troubleshooting 101, was plug in a new device. Okay, well, that's where you go to uh, the device messenger, as you said, and run that. And sure enough, there it is. It's giving me a, you know, basically it was having problems with the headset. So I unplugged it, plugged it back in, still wasn't working, rebooted, everything was good. But I was able to determine that by using these commands. Well done, sir. Well done. Uh, I have used very extensively an, an upgraded logging system called rsyslog, which is very cool. But nonetheless, all of these different syslog solutions support remote logging. And it is very easy to set up, you guys. You can just go Google it. It is, it is just a couple of lines in your syslog config. You put in the remote host address. You put in what category of alerts you want to send to the remote host. Then you go to the remote host. You turn on remote listening. And you tell it where you want it to file things from remote hosts and what file you want them to save it in, and you're done. And what you, you could have every Linux box in your house send all of its logs to one computer. Well, that's now, a time saver, yeah. There's a okay. couple of reasons you might want to do that. You might have one of these graphical tools we're about to cover, and you might just want to be able to parse through a lot of logs and do some different filtering. The other thing you might want to do is secure your system, and you want to know that if somebody's been on your box and they're altering your system, and maybe messing with some files on there, something like that. If you're having the logs captured remotely, if they go blank out your local logs, doesn't matter. 
It doesn't matter because you have them on your remote host and you, you can go back and refer to them and you know they're isolated and they're separate. The other thing that's nice is if your hard drive dies on your main, on one of your systems and you have the logs on another, if you have the logs, or if it's some sort of crash and you have the logs on another box, you can kind of go back and figure out what happened, which is kind of cool too. That's a big help, I think. Yeah. yeah. Being able to kind of retro back and say, hey, you know, what caused that crash and how can I not duplicate it again? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Also, yeah. a lot of routers support remote syslogging. A lot of the Link uh, they will. So if you could turn, if you turn that on on your Linux box, you mm -hmm. can have some of the devices on your network send logs to your Linux box and then you can review them and see what's going on. Nice. So uh, I've got a lot of more details in the show notes. I just wanted to cover some of the tools quickly. I know the command line stuff doesn't translate very well to audio, so I will leave all of that stuff written up in the show notes with example commands and descriptions. You can go check that out. Now, mm -hmm. Matt, before we go on to the next segment, which will be covering graphical tools, uh, mm -hmm. I want to give a quick mention to our buddies over at System76.com because they're going to be sponsoring our how-to segment this week, and these guys have hooked us up with an awesome desktop. Which one did you get? The Wild Dog. Oh, yeah, the Wild Dog Performance, and which is a great machine. It has been rock-solid stable. I, I can't get over it. It's so quiet that I actually have to put my head next to it to see if it's even turned on. I can't get over that. It's just that's, amazing to me. That's perfect. Very powerful. Very powerful machine. Really, if you're looking for desktop, I highly, highly recommend it. And, you know, you your connection, you look great today. You're on Skype 4. It sounds yeah. really good. I, I think I might get one of these machines for uh, an extra Skype connection. This with the, with the low noise profile of this, it's perfect for studio recording. Oh, it just works so. out. Exactly. I'm not getting a lot. of. I have a USB headset connected to the machine itself and just a Logitech HD webcam. And boom, bam, boom, with the new Skype, I'm good to go. And awesome. it runs really well. I'm really happy with it. So uh, thank you to System76 for supporting and sponsoring the how-to segments. And with that said, let's get into the how-to segment. All right, now let's talk about ways you can look at these logs without even having to go to the terminal. I got two apps that run right on your desktop and then a right. third app that runs in your web browser. Nice. Now, the first one I want to talk about is one for the KDE folks out there, and it's called K-System Log. And you can actually load this on uh, any desktop. It doesn't have to be KDE desktop, and it's actually a really nice log viewer. What I like about this one is uh, right along the top, if you're not very inherently familiar with the log options available in Linux, they let you just jump right to certain key logs, like the system log or the kernel log, or the authentication log, or the xorg log if you're having x problems. And you can jump right to those specific logs, and that is very handy for new beginners. Another thing that it does very well is, let's go over like this system log, for example. If I type in sandwich, because didn't I, I did sandwich earlier, yep, there you go. You did I, do sandwich. I love sandwiches comes up, and it lets you parse through the logs very, very fast. So at this, you could also do something here like, um, you know, if, if you're having HTTP D issues, you could search for that, or Samba issues, you could search for those in there. So this is a very nice, very fast application for managing this. So it's K system log. Now, Matt, the one you're probably familiar with is the one that comes built into Ubuntu. Uh, mm -hmm. And this one is just straight up called Log File Viewer or Log Viewer, or it depends on your distribution's choice. It, it comes, it's with, it's a GNOME desktop, and most GNOME desktops ship this one with default. Uh, with it as a default installation. It, it's a little more simpler than K-System Log, uh, but it does do a couple of things I like a lot. Like K-System Log, it, uh, it, it's live updating, so if you scroll to the very bottom, it's always the absolute latest logs, and those latest logs are written in bold. So since you've updated mm -hmm. the application, anything that gets written to the log since you've loaded this app shows up in bold, so you can diagnose something that's happening in real time. It also, on the left-hand side, shows you your different log uh, you, can, you can dig through. It doesn't have as many as the KSYS log does, but it has some of them in here, and it breaks them up into day, which it parses them out very easily, so I can see here's my Sunday log, here's my Wednesday log. That's very nice. I like that. It's um, easy to navigate. Yeah. And, and when your log files get very long, it's nice to be able to break it up by day like that. So having support for that is, is a perk. Sure. One of the things it doesn't have that K-System Log does have, and I like this a lot, is if I go back over to K-System Log, is K-System Log can do tabs. Oh, no, that's something I'd consider. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and the nice thing about tabs is if you're looking at one with the system log and maybe your other one's your xorg log, you could be diagnosing video drivers from two different log options. And I, I just find that to be kind of valuable. Uh, I, like, mm. I like the option they did that. The other thing they did for testing in case system log, which is really nice, is you remember that logger command I typed yep. that I said I like sandwiches? Oh, yes. Yeah, where well, you actually put that in. Yeah. K system log actually gives you that in a GUI interface. 
you can go file new log and you can say what you want the message to be, what priority it should be on your system. So if it's an error, if it's a warning or it's an alert, these are all different types of loggings that can happen on a Linux system. Um, and what uh, what type of log you want to go do. So, so to the syslog or the authentication log or the kernel log and what you want to say. And you hit OK and it will echo that into your log file for you. You don't even have to open up the terminal file. Well, that's interesting. Well, so it seems like that the KDE option gives you more. It's probably going to be a smoother transition if you're trying to do some troubleshooting. Yeah. Where the uh, the Ubuntu GNOME option basically is, you happen to have it open and you want to stare at something. It just seems a little more limited to me. Yeah, I think um, if you were yeah. more inherently familiar with Linux logs, the Ubuntu yeah. one uh, or the GNOME one. I'm sorry, the GNOME, the GNOME log viewer. It 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 would be the yeah. better route because you know what to look for. The True. thing about the K-System log one is it's a little more like event viewer in the sense that, uh, you know, you actually get like, again, you get a selection of logs that you want to look mm -hmm. at and what the specific services you want to look at. Like you can go look at the Apache log or the Postfix log or the Cups log. Yeah. You know, that's a little more event viewer like, but even better. Whereas the the GNOME one is, yeah, it's kind of like... You know, it just seems like the KDE one is going to be a more, especially if you're coming from another operating system, it's just going to be an easier flow to, um, totally. I think. And, and the fact you can run the KDE one on Ubuntu. And so it looks fine. Not like it's stopping you. Yeah. No, yeah. Some libraries, I'm sure, got to be installed with it, but that's no big deal. So you can check out uh, K-System yeah. Log. That's uh, over at kde.org slash application slash system slash K-System Log or link in nice. uh, show notes. Uh, let's talk about one that you can run in your web browser, though. And oh, okay. this one might be a little controversial. It's Webmin. Mm. Webmin, some people love it. Some people hate mm. it. I don't want to get into that aspect of it. Just know that anytime you open up a remote listening service on your computer, you are essentially creating another attack vector. However, if you stay up current on your patches and lock things down appropriately and use good password management, you'll probably be okay. Webmin has a log viewing component built into it, and it's really a good one. And it lets you look at the different logs on your system and through a web interface. So you can be anywhere in the world. You can be look. You can log into Webmin if you have access to it, and you can look at the different logs that it can read. And, uh, I, I've used this for years. I haven't used it probably in the last couple of years, but mm -hmm. in the past, it's been awesome. The other thing that's really nice about the Webmin approach is if you have multiple people that you need to be able to look at the logs and you don't want them getting on the console of your server, you can give them a Webmin login and you can lock their Webmin account down to only being able to view the system logs. So when they log in, they see the logs and that's all they get. And that is very nice for developers who are troubleshooting but don't need actual root access to a box and things like that. So uh, Webmin, and it comes built into the Webmin um, package. Webmin isn't necessarily in all distros repos, but both ca both K system log are, and the GNOME log viewer is as well. Um, and if you, if it's not, you're using the wrong distro. Well, one question I have about it is as far as security, because you're obviously sending stuff out to the cloud, if you mm -hmm. will. Um, sh are there security concerns? What you know? What types of things should people be aware of as this versus running something locally? Well, anytime. So anytime you have a, a daemon that runs and listens for incoming connections and takes authentication. <laughs> That is step number one. You've opened, you've opened up a door. And you need okay. to have a really good lock. The second concern about Webmin is that the things that it does have control over are the very fundamentals that you would want with root access. You know, okay. even, even down to like formatting your file system, you can do that through right. Webmin and all these kinds of things. So if you compromise and access Webmin, you really own the box. You can, you can open see. up terminals, you can create users, you can start applications, you can delete mm -hmm. stuff. I mean, it's, it's full-fledged on. And that's... Also, the power of Webmin, right? Because mm -hmm. if it's locked down appropriately and you need remote web-based management of a Linux box, well, that's what Webmin's for. Um, it's so if you're keeping up on your security, then there really shouldn't be an issue as long as you're yeah. actually... If it's locked down properly and you're aware when it's on, when it's not... You know, the thing to be aware, yeah. Webmin's had issues in the past. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, it, it, it's not one of those things where it has, like, this flawless track record. So sure, of course. Nothing does. Yeah. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'd fully recommend it, Mm -hmm. That said, I use it. I have used it. I don't use it currently. I think it's. I think it's kind of trailing off in its popularity. But uh, in terms of you know just looking at logs remotely, yeah. it's a good way to do it. Well, it seems like it would be a good solution if you kind of treat it as a water on, water off solution. Uh, you're not running it constantly, but you know mm -hmm. you need some remote access. Mm -hmm. Use it, great. If you're not, that's okay too. Um, and yeah. what a lot of like Fedora yeah. and a lot of distros do is they run it as as part of of an ex uh, uh, Zynet in that D or whatever you call it, where it's mm -hmm. it's a super daemon. You start the super daemon, and Webmin isn't running all the time. But if okay. a request comes in on on the Webmin port, the super daemon then goes and launches Webmin. And the nice thing about that is you can actually put some additional controls in front of Webmin, and then you can also do things like IP tables and you know lock it down so that only certain IPs can connect. And you, if you do a combination approach to security where it's good passwords, good patches, maybe mm -hmm. some IP restrictions, 
Uh, right. Maybe something through uh, Zynet D, then you're going to be okay. Makes sense to me. Okay, I think that I think that's pretty pretty valuable. Then cool. All, All right. right, there you have it. Well, that's the Linux Action Show's look at graphical log viewers for Linux. If you've got another one, send it in or leave a comment. Linux Action Show at JupiterBroadcasting.com. And that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast. Matt, thank you for filling in, even though you got a sick tummy. Uh, happy to help. Happy hey, to where help. can uh, where can people check out what you're working on this week? I know you got something new coming up, don't you? Right now, uh, my wife and I worked on a joint project. It's called the Jobs Se- or Job Seekers Cookbook, and I will actually uh, make sure that's available in the show notes. But the basically it comes down to Job Seekers plural cookbook. And the idea of it is that there's a lot of job advice being tossed around on the internet right now, and most of it is bad. So we basically came up with a way of making it even worse, but at the same time, throwing out some self-employment ideas that, despite the humor, well, just go check it out. I think you'll it'll make sense to you when you get there. But basically, the idea is that you don't have to hate your job. You don't have to uh, be in a situation you don't like. But at the same time, you can check out other things that are out there and explore new opportunities without uh, selling your soul for a paycheck. And wow. so, yes, we're very, very, uh, very much making fun of the job hunting process. Very, very much so. Uh, well, very well timed, yeah, I must say. Very yeah, well timed. It's, it's hard to describe. <laughs> it's, it's definitely a well, social experiment, but check it out. It, it sounds very cool. So where do we go? That is going to be jobseekerscookbook.com, J-O-B-S-E-E-K-E-R-S, cookbook.com. That's a great idea, man. I'll check that out. Very cool. Yeah, put a link in the show notes. People can click that. All right, let's get to an email that was sent in by Jeffrey, and I hope he hasn't waited too long because it sounds rather urgent. Here he goes. Jeffrey writes, hi, Chris, and Matt, of course. Uh, I'm a big fan of Jupiter Broadcasting. I catch last and TechSnap every week. Good on you, Jeffrey. Now start watching Coda Radio and Unfilter and really, really have yourself set. Uh, uh, he says, I have an om- iOmega NAS uh, that bit the dust, and I want to recover the data from the hard drives. I think the hard drives are fine, just the NAS enclosure is fried, which I hate it when that happens. Uh, when I plug the hard drives into my laptop running Arch, Awesome! It shows as LVM PV. Hmm. File system, as seen in the file system, we include a screenshot of Gpart, and I, I saw that. Right. Uh, he says the NAS has two hard drives that were part of a RAID 1 array, I think. Uh, he's not positive how they had it set up. Uh, how can I mount this to recover the data on the disk? Maybe Matt can cover how to on mounting obscure file systems, RAID drives, etc. Well, what I thought was interesting in that, Matt, was that the drives detected as LVM2 PV, Damn. which means that I Omega NAS must have been running Linux and using logical volume management because that's what right. the LVM is. Now the good news is, is Jeffrey, if you go grab a like a boot CD, like System Rescue CD, which mm-hmm. I love, uh, it supports uh, LVM and it has tools on there called like PV Scan, and there's a bunch of other tools with LVM where they will automatically scan all the volumes and sort of enumerate the different paths that are on there and then you can you can get that information and you can mount it. So go Google around for different tricks to to recover and mount an LVM volume and use that system rescue CD. It's awesome for that and uh, that I think will get you rolling. The good news is is if that is really LVM and it wasn't a RAID 1, that's industry standard stuff and you might actually be okay. So that's that's wild not great that the enclosure died the fact that they're using some sort of obscure custom RAID or file system means you might be in actually pretty good shape. So Makes sense to me. And that's System Rescue CD. Yeah. yeah. You just Google that and you should be able to get it. I love System Rescue CD. And it's awesome. nice and small. It's like 300 mm-hmm. meg download or something like that. And it's not bad at all. All right, Matt. Well, uh, before we get out of here, I want to talk about the Jupiter Broadcasting radio project that we're launching. So last week, we talked about Source Fabrics Airtime. And the guys mm. contacted me and they said, Chris, we love the review you did. We're so glad that you like the product. We're fans of the show, blah, 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 right? Sure. And they said, we'd like to hook you up with a pro account to try it out because, you know, it's kind of a new service. And I think they need us to kick the tires a little bit. And I, I, they knew I had some interest in creating a community-based Jupiter Broadcasting radio station. And so, but the problem is if it's successful, it's got to be hosted on a pretty good box, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, they have a complete hosted airtime solution a- along with their product project. So I am now hosting a JB Radio server on the airtime hosted services, and uh, I'm paying just like a little bit for extra listeners, but they're giving me the base infrastructure for free as like a as like I think probably as like a, a way to kick the tires for them. That's um, a sweet deal. And okay. yeah, so that was like the key component we needed for infrastructure to do this. So I am starting uh, to really take this seriously, and what I want to do is create a 24/7 radio station that's full of of varied content all the time. Uh, everything from Creative Commons licensed music 
uh, to podcasts from people in the community, to our own shows, to old time radio, to live only oh, cool. chat shows, everything like that. That sounds pretty cool. So kind of a twenty four seven type of deal. Totally yeah. over at J- yeah. and the beginnings are over at jblive dot uh, dot am. But uh, if you are interested, if you have like uh, if you have a large collection of Creative Commons music that you could create some playlists for, you don't even have to be on mic if you just want to make some playlists. Uh, but and I want to hear from those people. But if you have a show, maybe it's something you already do. Maybe it's a podcast that exists. Maybe you've got an idea for an awesome show that you've always wanted to do, but you just need an infrastructure to do it on. Let's talk. Go over to bit.ly slash DJ Draft or use the link in the show notes. Bit.ly slash DJ Draft is a questionnaire form that I've assembled. And if you're interested in hosting a show on the Jupiter Broadcasting Radio Network, I have a few questions I'd like you to fill out and then submit it. I'll tell you, to be honest, I'm only going to start with a very small group of people. I'll do this very organically. I'll get, I'll, I'll vet a small group. We'll start with them and we'll have some beginning programming that way. And then we'll kind of expand out from there. Also, if you would be interested in managing the radio network, taking care of the scheduling, resolving conflicts, seeking out new talent, maybe even promoting things like that, let me know. Because running this whole network and doing six shows a week keeps me very, very busy. Mm -hmm. So I can't dedicate a lot of time to it. So eventually, I'll be looking for somebody in the community that would love to take that on. um, And I'd love to talk to you. So you can also fill that form out and just, I know some of the questions won't apply for that type of stuff, but, you know, just mention in there you want to do that. Uh, I will give special consideration to people who have done internet broadcasting before, and I would really love to see somebody who's worked with airtime before, because mm-hmm. I'd love for somebody to be able to manage the calendar and do all of that kind of stuff. So uh, check that out. Go over to bit.ly slash DJ Draft. If you've got a show that's already existing, I'd love to talk to you. If you have a podcast that has multiple hosts and you know how to take Skype calls and things like that, I'd really love to talk to you. Let's broadcast that on the network. Let's get some new independent community content on there. I want something that people can tune into if they're sitting at their desk or they're sitting in traffic and they just want some entertainment and they don't want to have to think about it. I mean, that's what I love about like movies on TV is Mm -hmm. they're not always that good, but like I have a thousand movies on my home server and I sit down and I can never figure out what the heck I want to watch. And I just scroll through the list. But when it's on TV, it's like, oh, that's, you know what? I'll just sit back and passively listen. It's much more just tune in, enjoy, and then tune out when you're done. I want to create something like that for everybody. Every hour of the day, I want content on that thing. I think this is going to be an awesome thing we can do. I'm already playing with like HTML5 embedded players for web pages and a high bit rate and a low bit rate and all that kind of stuff. So we're getting close, but it's still very much at ground zero. So if you'd like to get involved with this project, let me know. Go to bit.ly slash DJ Draft. And uh, let's get the ball rolling on this thing. This could be a ton of fun, Matt. That sounds awesome to me. And I think it's going to be interesting to see what types of content uh, the community comes up with, um, it, whether it'll be music or whether it'll be talked content or what, or maybe even some new shows we've yet to even uh, conceive of. You never know. Exciting. Yeah. You never know. Something, something brand new could come from that, something we've never considered. So uh, if you're considering it, go, go sign up. And uh, I, I probably won't be getting back to everybody, but I'm going to try to get back to a small handful of folks and – Kind of a first come, first serve type of deal. Yeah, yeah. and I kind of I want to keep it small at first, just so that mm-hmm. way it's something I can I can kind of manage, and it doesn't doesn't start detracting from my other focuses on the network, and then see where it grows from there, that kind of stuff. But yeah. I gotta say, I I've been playing with Airtime for the last week. It is some sweet software, and oh, using awesome. using stuff like Mix and sending remote transmissions and all that kind of stuff. I, I love it. So uh, it's going to be a lot of fun, and I'm curious to see where it goes. Uh, and and again. I, I'm looking for people, even if they just want to make music mixes. It just mm-hmm. can't be copyrighted content. Uh, right. And you, you don't even have to get on mic, but I really would love some people that want to get on mic that have some good audio gear and stuff like that. All right, Matt. Well, I think right. that's just about everything we wanted to cover in this segment of the show, which means we've come to the end of the Linux Action Show for this week. Now, uh, we'll be back next week. We're live Sundays at 10 a.m. Pacific mm-hmm. over at jblive.tv, and you can also listen at jblive.am. Uh, and I think the B-Man should be back next week, as far as I know. And uh, also, check out Coder Radio. It comes out on Mondays. It'll be live Mondays at 9 a.m. Pacific, which is noon Eastern. And uh, we're talking about JavaScript and how it is not mm-hmm. assembly. Yeah, I believe that's the title. JavaScript is not assembly. <laughs> so it should be an interesting episode. Tune in for that. We do it live, and we'd love to have you there in our chat room because we have that up on the screen while we go. And so if you show up and you bring up a good, interesting point in the chat room, it gets right up there in the video version for other people to see, too. So it's a fun, interactive way to watch the show. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning into this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. I'll see you right back here next week.
You know, I think about you guys, you know, and I get inside your head and I think, and then boom! That's what I show you. Boom! That's what you see. Yo, yo, yo. Okay. Alright. There we go. Sorry about that live stream. See, this is the stream come back. Stream come back. Whoa. Ho, ho, ho. Stream come back.